Hello, everyone. Welcome to another very special episode of the live Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Fabienne Jacquet. Uh, she is a scientist uh, with a specialty in understanding the differences between men and women, masculine and feminine ways of thinking, uh, and also the author of the book, uh, Venus Genius. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the uh, different ways of thinking and how they affect innovation, innovation teams, and uh, uh, innovative outcomes. Um, Fabienne, it's wonderful having you here today. Thank you for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Uh, so for anyone who's watching live on LinkedIn right now, uh, don't forget, uh, if you find this topic interesting and you want other people uh, to uh, to watch along live with you, uh, give it a like, uh, a heart or whatever your uh, preference is on LinkedIn or share it out. Um, and just as importantly, if you're listening live or in the recording afterwards, uh, we can see the comments as they come in. So if you have a specific question you'd like to ask or something uh, that really resonates with you, write it in, uh, in the comments. And uh, maybe we'll give it a shout out while we're doing the broadcast as well. But now on to our star guest for today, uh, Fabienne. For people who don't know about you and the work that you do, uh, could you just give us a brief summary as to where you got started and how you got to where you are now? Absolutely. Actually, I'm a scientist. I'm a PhD in organic chemistry. And I moved to marketing in the middle of my career, starting from scratch as assistant product manager because my passion has always been innovation, understanding how it works, challenging the way we do things and trying, you know, with in all humility to create a better world. So as a scientist, I understood what was happening in the beaker between the molecules. I wanted to understand how those products could affect the consumer's mind and their decision uh, in purchasing. So this is why, you know, I took this drastic move <laughs> um, going into uh, marketing. Now, I worked for 31 years in the marketing in the corporate world. And as we know, these are facts, not pointing fingers. This is a very masculine world. First, the world generally is more driven by male energy. And especially in the corporate world, it's more a male dominated world. And that's fine. Again, this is the fact. Now, I felt when I left the corporate world and wanted to create something uh, on my own, that I needed to reconnect the corporate world to the feminine and especially innovation. And this was in parallel with my personal journey of moving from the masculine toward the feminine. Having been you know, born and raised between two brothers and being a scientist as a baby boomer, we didn't have so many women in that uh, field. I had to really draw from my masculine energy to fit in, but had the it's cold deep in my belly that I needed to rebalance towards the feminine, which happened in my personal life and helped me be a better innovator, moving from the lonely wolf, you know, lonely scientist discovering the world towards a more collaborative and empathetic approach. Uh, and I think this is what uh, is the basis of your book, uh, Venus Genius, isn't it? Absolutely. Venus Genius is about that. It's rebalancing the feminine and the masculine because we need both for innovation. We need the masculine when you have the second phase of innovation, which is execution, you know, taking a prototype, bringing it to execution and commercial. This is very organized, focused decision making. So the masculine energy in us. And the other side is really the feminine, which is the discovery which is a little bit chaotic, where you need empathy, you need a lot of uh, other feminine traits. And actually through research, I have, and my own experience, 
I have selected six feminine traits that I put under a chemical formula, which is not really very scientific, but it makes <laughs> the point. So I have empathy plus nurturing plus inclusivity and intuition, gratitude. And I have the arrow of the chemical reaction. When you um, put the catalyst of collaboration, gives you a little heart and a dollar sign, meaning innovation that resonates emotionally with the consumers because of all the feminine work you have done before. And of course, brings money to the bottom line because this is why we are doing innovation. So uh, I think we'll get into each of those aspects uh, in a moment. But uh, I, I think my question to you is, um, what, what is the issue with uh, femininity and uh, with women in innovation? Uh, why is there such a lack of women engaged in that activity? This is a big question. And I did a lot of research for the book because I had some hypotheses. But like any good scientist, I had to check that and back up with data. So innovation before was really based on the technology and the patents, measured with patents. So innovation was linked to science technology. It happens that until recently, women were not really welcome in the, the field of technology and science. And still, you know, in STEM, you, we have a low percentage of, of women. It has to, uh, to evolve. So by definition, women were not really part of innovation because they were not part of the scientific field. It started to get better when in the middle of last century, the innovation really started to move more towards the business services and so on. So it was more open to different backgrounds. So women started to be there. Another aspect, which is very interesting, talking about the masculine and feminine balance is that in, <laughs> before, when you were saying you were an innovator, it was like, it was an insult, it was terrible. You didn't want to be an innovator. I have this quote where innovators had their ears cut off before, and it's true in the dark ages. So innovator was really for the rebels, it was for, for the adventurers. And the common you know, understanding is that men are more adventurers and girls are quieter and so on, which is not always the case. I'm a good counterexample, <laughs> but it was the case. So by, again, by, predisposition, women didn't go to innovation. And the last aspect also is that innovation is driven now a lot by the corporate world and the academic world. And unfortunately, there again, women are not really promoted. They are not in big positions. They still, you know, in the 20% of, of a female in the C-suite and uh, in some countries is 5% of women CEOs. So how do you want to drive innovation when you are not in a decision seat? Um, now, if I can play devil's advocate for a moment. I love that. <laughs> What, what, what is the reason why we need more women in innovation? Because they bring a complementary behavior and attitude and insight and input. Um, as I say, it's not about the book, it's not about men and women. It's not opposing both. It's dealing with the feminine and the masculine, all human beings have in us. And as I tell a lot of men, I may have more masculine in me than you have in you. So it's not really pointing fingers and men versus women. It's really this balance, like, you know, yin and yang and so on, between the masculine and the, and the, and the feminine. And again, so far, innovation has been driven and handled like a business based on male energy. So I have an idea, I jump into execution. When you do that, you miss a lot of opportunities because when you start innovating, you have small ideas and those ideas are very fragile. And nurturing, which is one of the feminine traits, which is more feminine, is helping those ideas to grow in bigger ideas because you never know. You can laugh at, at an idea, oh, this is a very funny idea, this is small and so on, but it can grow into something big. And we know the world of inventions is, is full of that. So by having both the masculine and the feminine, you have more complete innovation. So it's really bringing innovation for me to another level. And again, it's masculine and feminine all together. You cannot have one or the other because if you only have big ideas and prototypes, you don't make any money. 
So what, what is the difference between uh, masculine and feminine in the way that you're describing it? It's not just uh, masculine men have masculine energy and feminine women have feminine energy. What, what's the, the, the difference that you're describing? Very good question. Again, for the book, I did some research. I interviewed some brain scientists because I was very interested in what's happening in the brain. And a scientist, Carissa Sanbon Butsuk, who, who is really, and he's, she's a transgender, so she knows what she's talking about, you know, the balance between feminine and masculine, because gender is not zero or one. We're all on the spectrum, actually. And what's happening is that in the brain, we have, it's a mosaic of female and male patches, and we can draw from one or the other. It happens that the male and female brain, so the brains of men and women are not that different. You have some differences in chemicals, in the um, correlation between the two hemispheres that explains that women are better at words, verbal communication, emotions, and so on. But the good news with the brain plasticity, anybody can acquire new skills, anybody can really acquire feminine and masculine. So it's more rebalancing between both in our brains, in our behavior, because if the brain doesn't make the biggest difference, what makes the difference is education and the environment. This is absolutely key. When you brainwash little girls that their color is pink and that they have to be a mother and you know, oh, they can be a nurse, but not a surgeon, it stays. So education is absolutely key there to make sure that we leverage both. And you can be very feminine. You can be very masculine. There is nothing wrong, but you have to find your own spot. Uh, and if we're going to list out what would, uh, in your case, be described as the list of the masculine traits and the feminine traits, uh, what traditionally uh, would be in those two different groups? I know we can always argue, and I try to stay out of this masculine, feminine, because we cannot say, oh, this is masculine, this is feminine. We have to agree. Again, I did a lot of research, and I got my uh, inspiration from a book, which is Shakti Leadership, from Nilima Bhatt and Rashi Sodia, and they have this very nice polarity map. So our masculine side is more into focus, and this comes from the brain, you know, the gray matter, the focus the decision making is very assertive, is very self confident. The feminine side is more empathetic, is more emotional, it's more uh, supportive, nurturing, and so on. Okay, so these are the big uh, feminine traits. But again, I don't have kids. Okay, I'm a woman, I don't have kids. So I don't have this nurturing thing. I do, I. I do nurturing another way with my friends, gardening, and so on. So you, we can acquire that. It depends, again, on the environment. So these are the, the key uh, traits. What is very important to notice is that these are the positive traits. But you have also the negative, like the toxic masculinity and the toxic femininity. And we don't talk a lot about the toxic um, femininity. But believe me, it exists. And women can be catty. They can be jealous, they can be very bad, okay? So I'm talking about elevating the feminine and the masculine through the positive traits, obviously. So let's go back to your scientific formula. Um, what were the, uh, the, the traits that you mentioned in there again? And let's talk about how it relates to innovation now. So okay. uh, how, how do these traits relate to, is it just the development new, of new ideas or the execution, the, uh, the, the, the comparison? How does it fit into the real end-to-end -end in, uh, innovation spectrum? And actually, in the book, I give tips to culture, you know, uh, to, to to cultivate uh, those traits because I think this is very important. So empathy, empathy is the foundation. Empathy helps you understand the real needs of the consumers. And unfortunately, as men, you know, you when men create for women, they see the women's world through their eyes. I have almost a chapter on high heels, and this is something people remember. I, I, I wore high heels, you know, my entire life, and I had recently foot surgery, and there is a correlation. So a designer, a, a men designer will say, oh, I designed the women's shoes thinking of men and the pleasure they will have to look at it. Well, have you thought about women, the torture it is to walk in these high heels the entire day? And again, it's not pointing fingers. They don't know better because they never did it. So it's really empathy helps you innovate products, solutions, and so on that are really 
answering the actual needs of the consumers, understanding their needs. But empathy doesn't stop at the consumers. You need to understand your coworkers because we work in silos and this is not good. We need to understand our bosses, the external partners. So empathy is really the foundation. Then when you go to um, inclusivity, inclusivity is not having diversity. It's not, you know, okay, I got it. I have X number of uh, French people, of, uh, <laughs> of black people, but this is not that at all. It's not uh, pointing an African-American woman and say, oh, I have a chief, uh, you know, um, a diversity officer. It doesn't work like that. It's really in the way we behave. And diversity and inclusion is having people bring their unique gift to the innovation table. So listening to what everybody has to say. Then we covered a little bit the nurturing, which is ideas can be very, um, very fragile when they are young and also businesses. So it applies to ideas, uh, nurturing ideas and nurturing small businesses. It's not for nothing that for the startups is called an incubator. You have to grow, help, not smoothen, okay, but really grow the ideas in so something bigger. Intuition is the most intriguing. Intuition, really, people think it's a crystal ball. It's not that at all. Intuition is really when you have, as an expert, accumulated a lot of information, and then you let your beautiful brain do the work and really connect the dots. And women are very good at that because we have more white matter. And the good news, as you age, we are better at connecting the dots and solving complex problems. So coming back to inclusivity, you like to have young and older people in an innovation team because they are complementary. So then when we move to collaboration, to me, this is the catalyst because technology goes very quickly. This is a big world. We cannot do it alone. I talk about Edison. Everybody thinks that Edison was this lonely inventor. He was not. He had a huge team of people. They had personal relationships. They were like a family. And you need to collaborate because not every, not anybody has all the answers. So you catalyze that and then, you know, you get innovation that makes sense, emotionally resonates with the consumer because, you know, it answers their, their really deep needs. And on top of this, it brings money because emotions is what sells product. And Simon Sinek and Steve Jobs, a lot of people have understood that. Um so what's, what, what, what do we actually need to do? Uh, and I think this comes back to uh, what you just talked about, uh, nature versus nurture, the fact that the brain is very plastic. There's a lot of research around that, also around how creativity could be improved, which I talk a lot about. Um, but uh, from your research uh, into your book, is this also something that uh, people of all ages can change? And what does it take to change? I think it takes everybody bringing their little piece of wisdom and experience to the edifice. And this is what I'm trying to do with the book. This is what I'm trying to do today. Because if everybody realizes and understands they are better human beings by, re by rebalancing the feminine, the masculine, by letting their emotions out, because again, this is what makes meaningful products, not another land extension that you know doesn't bring anything and we're overwhelmed with products that we don't really need. And we know the challenge with the environment. We know all those challenges. So when we look at these big challenges, the social, the political, the environment, and we bring our authentic and whole self to this innovation, it makes a difference. We create better solutions. And it starts with the young target. This is why, actually, before you ask me what's next, <laughs> I am working on a video course and a fellowship for adolescents, for them to better understand what their Venus genius is and exploit that to create their future me. So it starts with education. It starts with, with really compassion, with love, understanding the others and allowing everybody to be different. And if you are very masculine, great. You bring this masculinity into the team and it's precious. But recognizing what we bring and everybody reaching their balance and full potential. As you've been speaking, I've, uh, I've been asking myself, um, about having teams with with the, a balance of these uh, traits. But if we look at an individual, um, let's say there is someone, uh, in, in my case, I'm a male, 
Um, I'm, I'm not going to claim that I'm the most masculine man in the world, but let's say my masculine traits are much more prominent than my uh, feminine traits. Are, are you suggesting that you can bring up the feminine traits of empathy, intuition, uh, all of the things you've listed without having to decrease the masculine traits? Uh, so you can be both highly masculine and highly feminine from the positive aspects? Or does bringing up your feminine traits effectively mean you're coming back to a more middle ground by decreasing your masculine traits? Excellent question. And I think actually it's both because if you increase more your nurturing and your empathy and so on, you will decrease the fact that we jump to solutions because it will you will be less you know, in the action and more in the thinking. So it, it may rebalance. However, I would argue also that the feminine, the masculine depends on the circumstances. Okay. So believe me, I can be very masculine <laughs> in some cases because the, the environment calls for it. So I think this is a question of adaptab adaptability. And I would say this is a question of awareness. A lot of men, when I give my workshop, men came to me and say, oh, thank you. I say, why? Because, you know, you I realized that because of the, the education, the environment, I had really pushed back some of my feminine traits, like intuition, which is absolutely critical for innovation. And so it's a question of being aware of. And then, you know, it's your freedom to use them or not. But at least the first step is be aware of them. You can work on them. I have tips in the, in the book. I have um, exercises in the workshop where you can bring that out. And then again, you find your own balance and you use them appropriately according to the circumstances. I was going to ask uh, how people can figure out maybe where they need to focus or where they need to improve. Let's assume that look, there's always going to be some people who are very uh, standoffish of uh, self-improvement or um, defensive. If you say maybe you're expressing too many masculine traits, they wouldn't be very receptive to wanting to find out uh, which masculine traits are maybe too strong and, and improve their feminine traits. But let's say there is someone who's open to the idea. Um, is, is there something they can do to do a, a self-assessment, self-checklist to find out where maybe they're overpowered in, in certain traits and, and where they should uh, aim to improve some of their uh, more lacking traits? This is another intriguing question because when I designed my workshop and also when I wrote the book, I was looking for all these tests that you can test your empathy level, your intuition and so on. It doesn't really work. It's so obvious <laughs> that, you know, understanding, uh, um, answering the question, well, you know, I'm in the street and somebody is lying down and so I pass my way or I help this person. <laughs> Hello, you de you definitely know what to answer to have a high level of empathy or whatever. So I don't find them very helpful. I have some of them, but the most helpful I found was the discussions between people in the workshop. I remember in the workshop, we had this HR head um, who was a, a woman. And I pair them at one point and I have the list on the screen of the masculine and the feminine and ask them to exchange what is feminine, what is masculine about them. And she was paired with a guy who was real, apparently macho and so on. And she thought he was like that. So at the end of the workshop, she came to me and said, you know what? This was such a great exercise because I always thought this guy was the ultimate macho and so masculine. And when we talked about what is masculine and feminine, I discovered a newly entire guy full of compassion, supporting people, helping, volunteering. And I was very amazed. I said, see, you didn't know that. And maybe him talking through that also, you know, <laughs> reconnected to, to this. So I think it's really the, the best way is self-assessment, but also talking to other people. I talk to my family. I talk to um, my friends. I uh, I you know, listen to the feedback I'm given. And sometimes I say, oops, I was not really masculine or feminine here. I can improve this trait. And uh, so for empathy, for example, um, a friend of mine in France lost her daddy. Okay. So I call her and I was, the first thing I almost said is, oh yeah, I understand what you are going through because I had lost my daddy too. Luckily, I'm trying to practice what I preach. And so I, I held on that and I started to ask questions and so on and so on. And at one point, she is the one who said, but Fabian, 
you lost your daddy too. So you, I'm sure you understand what I mean. So you see, she, she recognized the empathy because it's reciprocal. So it's really practicing, it's really listening and self-assessment. But to your point, you have to be ready for the journey because it's a lifelong journey. Absolutely. I'm still working on it. <laughs> as am I, as am I. Um, Fabian, I've, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. I think we're coming up on time uh, for probably the last question of the interview. Uh, and it's one that a lot of uh, uh, leaders are probably going to be interested in. So we've talked about individuals and how they might look at their traits. We've maybe even looked at teams about how they might discuss the, the traits of their team members. But, but what about at the company or organization level? You've said at the beginning that there's still an underrepresentation of women, uh, especially when it comes to uh, innovation and, and science subjects. Do you believe that there needs to be an emphasis on getting more women into those positions? Uh, and if so, are there any sort of activities which companies should be doing, maybe preferentially uh, bringing women into those positions? Or is it just something that needs to evolve from a young age upwards where uh, more women are enticed to come into those uh, career paths and study paths? It's not an easy question because I understand the quotas. And for example, in France, we do practice quotas for men and women and so on, but it, it can fire back, as you know, okay, because you can have a lot of incompetent women also. And so this is something which is delicate. I think to be more aware of the diversity, but helping women grow in the company. For example, women a lot of times are stopped because they have to take care of the house, the kids and so on. So rebalancing, giving, you know, like the paternity leave, uh, helping men also take their part and rebalance the responsibilities and give, if companies give these means to the people, it will help a lot. So recognizing the unique contribution, either male or female, but make sure we have the diversity, but not forced diversity, because this doesn't really work. Really inclusivity, helping people be, create a safe environment so that people can be their really authentic and own self, their whole self, as I always say. My team still remembers to say, Fabian say, bring your whole self at work. Don't tell me you're creative at home and you lose that coming to work, okay? So recognizing that, having this safe environment, allowing people to grow their own way, bring their unique gift to the company. And again, I'm coming back to that, education, 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 and give. I was lucky enough that being between two brothers, my parents told me, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can be a scientist, you can be an engineer, you can be whatever you want as long as you work and you deserve it. And no, I did. So giving the opportunity, whatever the gender is, educating, opening the mind. And this is what, again, I'm trying to do. Perfect. Uh, inspiring words to end on. Um, Fabienne, if people want to find out more about you, your book, the insights in the book, uh, or, or anything else that you've got going on, uh, what's the best place they can go to find out more? So I have a website, which is innovive.com, I-N-N-O-E-V-E.com. I'm on LinkedIn. You will recognize me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I do have also, I'm on other social uh, media platforms too, uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook. For the book, the book is sold on Amazon, on uh, Kobo, on, um, and you can also write reviews if you like it on Goodreads and Amazon uh, and Barnes & Noble also. It's, uh, it's there. Venus Genius, the female prescription for innovation. The hardcover will be published in April, which is very exciting. And the audiobook should be available in August. Perfect. Uh, I'll make sure when we put this out as a blog article and a podcast to get all of those links down in the description below as well. Uh, Fabienne, it's been really wonderful speaking with you, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you to all of those who listened. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.